so now without further ado uh, please welcome our conference keynote uh, CEO of Community Foundations Canada uh, social finance and regulatory expert uh, and I would say a strong advocate for uh, transformative change uh, in the sector uh, Mr. Andrew Chinilo. Thank you Isidora and thank you Manuel and John Mark. Um, I've had the opportunity to um, have a few conversations with all three of those folks over the last uh, 12 or 13 months. And many of the things that I will talk about has actually been informed um, through those conversations. So um, uh, I, I've enjoyed the, the collegial um, debates that we've had and how that's informing the work that we're currently doing. Isidora mentioned uh, transformation. Uh, and the last four months have given rise to a call for transformation. Transforming our institutions, our thinking, our business models, and our patterns as human beings. Some transformation was opposed upon us through the global pandemic. We had no choice but to accept transformation in some ways. When we reach the moment of safety, security, and comfort again, Will we remain vigilant in driving transformation or will we choose to rebound to the past? New language has been established indicating transformation is here for the foreseeable future. Words and phrases such as build back better, just recovery and inclusive economies. Even this plenary is entitled Restructuring Ontario's Philanthropic Action. All indicate one big thing. Status quo is not on and change is not good enough. I am sure all of you have become familiar with these words and phrases as they show up everywhere, including this conference. This new language isn't simply aspirational, <clears throat> or prophetic. It provides context for what communities are going through and what communities require. And what communities require is transformation. Every sector and industry is rapidly rethinking how they create value. Philanthropic institutions must do the same. Why is transformation on the agenda? The answer is simple. Economic and social inequality is plaguing our communities at a dangerously high level. And the existing way we coalesce philanthropic assets and granting will not meet the tests of a post-pandemic recovery. We should also acknowledge we are at the advent of building a new economy here in Canada and throughout the world, a new outlook and a new psychology that will address inequality unlike the way we have seen in the past. Philanthropy must lead this conversation by examining our role first. The question in front of us today, what is philanthropy's role in this new economy? How will we address inequality as institutions of philanthropy? Before we answer this question, we must understand who we are. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although, philan although philanthropy's role has been to resolve certain outcomes related to economic inequality, we have also been a beneficiary. According to the Broadbent Institute, the top 20% of Canadians hold 68% of the overall wealth. The top 40% of Canadians hold 90% of the wealth. From this, we can deduce that 60% of Canadians share in a meager 10% of the overall wealth in Canada. Economic inequality is alive and well. In fact, 91% of Canadians think economic inequality exists right here in Canada. As we all know, the pandemic has caused further proliferation of this inequality, and the numbers are likely worse than the ones I provided. We should also recognize that our donors belong to the top 20% of Canadians. 
This is our paradox that has been referred to by the authors of Winners Take All and Decolonizing Wealth. So let me be crystal clear on the paradox. Philanthropic institutions rely upon an economic system that creates excess wealth. This wealth is used to establish and set up foundations, endowments, and donor advised funds. In turn, our job is to redistribute that wealth to alleviate the issues created by that same unequal distribution of wealth. We are fortunate to have philanthropic institutions. We capture wealth creation, work with altruistic, generous, community-minded donors to do good. As a Canadian, I am grateful to have such infrastructure and institutions building social cohesion and resilient communities across this country. However, are we really addressing the systemic issues driving inequality or are we part of it? Are we effective redistributors of wealth? To help answer this question, I want to familiarize you with the term trickle-down economics, also known as supply-side economics. It is a form of economic stimulus in which re tax reductions on the wealthy and big businesses in the short term will spur economic growth in the long term. This form of stimulus has worked in the past if spurring GDP growth is the primary measure of success. GDP growth does flow from the successful implementation of trickle-down economics. However, the story doesn't end there. Although GDP growth is important, ensuring as many people as possible can achieve economic empowerment through GDP growth is critical to alleviating inequality. A recent study by the London School of Economics has demonstrated that trickle-down economics, while growing the economy, does not resolve economic inequality. Why is that? Well, for each dollar of tax savings realized by a high net worth individual or a large corporation, 35 cents is utilized for spending. For middle and working class Canadians, the number is between 85 and 90 cents. And for lower income Canadians, the full tax dollar is spent to meet basic needs. And so although everyone benefits from tax cuts, wealthy people and businesses, big businesses, benefit at a disproportionately higher rate because of accumulation and thereby inequality grows. <clears throat> you may ask, what does this have to do with philanthropy? What does this have to do with our roles as being the holders and redistributors of wealth? Think about it in the following way. Philanthropy is a form of economic stimulus at the community level. We provide much needed grants and support for community organizations. We do this by investing wealth created within our economic system to create more wealth. Consequently, we distribute the earnings on the wealth and not the capital itself. Why? Endowments are typically permanent and meant to last forever. We never spend them. As the numbers demonstrate, we do spend income on capital. We have a floor in Canada, it's called a disbursement quota, and that floor requires that we spend 3.5% of our capital at a minimum. Many foundations, particularly community foundations, can spend up to 10% of capital depending on market returns. In my opinion, the business model of philanthropic organizations like endowments is trickle-down philanthropy. It's the corollary of trickle-down economics. Remember, in trickle-down economics, tax cuts for the wealthy resulted in 35 cents on the dollar being spent to stimulate the economy, meaning 
the wealthiest people were accumulating more capital than they were spending and doing so at a higher rate than anyone else. Foundations follow a similar pattern. We build wealth each and every year through the growth of endowments and donor advised funds. The growth is consequential to economic growth, which is supposed to be good for communities and society. However, if we never spend that wealth and only spend the investment income related to it, the obvious question is, are we resolving inequality or are we perpetuating it naturally through our business models? Is it equitable? Is it just? Or is it sustainable for wealth to accumulate in the hands of philanthropic institutions? The answer to that question will truly define us going forward. A critical outcome of economic growth is wealth. Wealth is empowering and uplifting. However, wealth must be deployed strategically and at a rate much higher than 3.5% to be truly empowering and uplifting. If we are serious about tackling inequality, we must rethink this notion of permanent endowments and disbursement quotas as low as 3.5%. To help us think about permanency and disbursement quota, let's examine our relationship with capital. Private and public foundations, family offices, investors, <clears throat> wealthy individuals, we all have a relationship with capital. Often, we value preserving capital. After all, it has taken a lot of effort sweat and generations to accumulate it. We have taken risks to acquire capital. Capital is empowering. It provides security, certainty, and safety. Capital feeds our sense of well-being. In fact, our economic system is centered around the acquisition and deployment of that very capital. Our ability to innovate and create new products and services hinges on capital. Our economy is great at producing capital. The GDP growth rate in Canada has been stellar over the last 60 years. Philanthropy, take note, the challenges we face are not centered on the system producing capital. It's on the system distributing capital. Thomas Piketty, is the author of the book, Capital in the 21st Century. Let me bring you into one of his contentions. Piketty contends that capital tends to grow over time at a faster rate than the overall economy. Let me repeat that. Capital grows faster than the economy. In simpler terms, those who hold capital accumulate more capital at a faster rate than those who simply generate income from employment. <clears throat> In the charitable sector, funders, foundations build capital at a faster rate than frontline operating charities can build sustainability through annual sources of funding. This is a powerful force and relationship which is increasing inequality, both in, this, both in society, but also in the charitable sector. I would ask you to consider the truth of Piketty's con con contention in the Canadian context. The last 14 months has proliferated this very pattern. We have heard about the K curve recovery. Canadians who held financial capital in the last 14 months have increased the amount of capital they have at dramatic rates in a very short period of time. At the same time, the incomes of the bottom 60% of the population have decreased or remain the same. Capital and income do not share 
the same growth pattern. We have all experienced this. Canadians are watching as real estate prices soar. All the major stock indices bottomed out last March and rebounded with vigor in the last 14 months. As I mentioned earlier, economic inequality is alive and well. Those with capital are doing well and those without it continue to suffer. Rising economic and social inequality threatens social cohesion and our peaceful democracy. So here we are. Many of us capital holders. Some of us have personal wealth. Others oversee institution, institutional or family wealth. And many manage and direct over philanthropic wealth. We can't be part of the solution if we are in fact part of the problem. Every philanthropic organization or funder must accept that safe approaches are no longer sufficient. The 95-5 model of accumulation versus spending must be revisited. We must reorient around the belief that philanthropic dollars serve as risk capital for innovation and social impact. Which brings me to our role as investors. We must reconsider our role as investors and deployers of capital. The investor of tomorrow will be vastly different than the investor of yesterday. Larry Fink, who's the CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, in his 2021 letter to CEO said, and I quote, there is no company whose business model won't be profoundly affected by the transition to a net zero economy, end of quote. Larry Fink also said, net zero demands a transformation of the entire economy, end of quote. Make no mistake, this includes an acceleration of capital deployment towards social ventures and entrepreneurship. Let me be unequivocal about this. Social enterprises are the primary tool for bridging the gap between capital accumulation and curbing inequality. Renowned Nobel Prize laureate Mohammed Yunus said, every time I see a problem, I create a social business to solve it. If we as capital holders are serious about tackling inequality in a transformative way, we must invest in social enterprises. If we hold philanthropic wealth, we must work towards 100% of our capital towards tackling inequality through the development of social enterprises. Granting 3.5%, even granting 8%, while investing in traditional capital markets is doomed to repeat the patterns of the past. Of course, if we want different outcomes, if we want transformation, sometimes we need different decision makers. Earlier on, I talked about understanding phil philanthropy's history and where we have come from, so we can understand exactly the things we want to transform. Trickle-down philanthropy is only part of the problem. It's a business model challenge and a technical one at that. However, our history goes beyond transactions and business models. We have cultural issues too. If we want transformation, we need new, younger, and much more diverse leaders and governors. We need people who are not invested in the models and the practices of the past. We also need to acknowledge the existence of institutional and systemic racism in the philanthropic sector. Last December, the Foundation for Black Communities released a report entitled Unfunded. In this report, of the philanthropic institutions evaluated, 0.7 of 1% of total grants were made to black serving organizations 
while 0.07 of 1% of grants were made to Black-led organizations. At the same time, Black Canadians represent just over 3.5% of the Canadian population. From the report, we can see how the current ecosystem of Canadian foundations has failed to address the needs of Black people in Canada. Our work with the Indigenous Peoples Resilience Fund would indicate the exact same pattern with Indigenous communities throughout Canada. Two months ago, a Statistics Canada survey created in collaboration with sector representatives found that immigrants and racialized people are underrepresented on the governing boards of charities and nonprofits in Canada. Keep in mind that as a country, by 2036, more than 50% of Canadians will be people of color. In some urban areas, the scale has already tipped. As a sector, we have work to do. Philanthropic institutions do not reflect the diversity of the communities they serve by way of their senior leadership or governance. The culture and representation of a diverse leadership group in this sector absolutely makes a difference. Let me give you a real life example. As I mentioned, the Foundation for Black Canadians commissioned a report called Unfunded. As a call to action, they requested philanthropic institutions across Canada to transfer an amount of three and a half percent of the value of their respective endowments to reflect the current portion of Black Canadians in Canada. To date, two private philanthropic foundations responded to that request and have answered the call to transfer three and a half percent. Those two foundations are the InSpirit Foundation and the Laidlaw Foundation, two organizations led by leaders of color. Leaders of color will make a difference in our sector. Diversity is a requirement for business model and cultural transformation. Now, let's talk about one of the most disruptive generations we've seen in a long time. They often get talked about. Millennials. This group was born between 1981 and 1996. They are between the ages of 25 and 40 years of age. Some quick facts about millennials that have come out just in recent days. 43% of millennials engage in impact investing compared to 12% of boomers. A 2019 Morgan Stanley survey showed that 95% of millennials backed sustainable investing compared to 85% of all investors. A study by Alliance noted 64% of millennials made investment choices based on values compared to 42% of boomers. A report from US Trust noted that 76% of millennials consider impact when investing compared to 29% of boomers. I can go on, but you get the picture. This pattern signals a generational collision in attitudes. Charitable giving has become charitable living for this next generation of Canadians. This attitude shifts this attitude shift suggests that millennials have less tunnel vision when talking about finance, politics, and social issues. Instead, their sense of the economy is interconnected, not at least because they do not treat an issue like the environment as a mere externality to an economic model. Clearly, philanthropic models represent the approaches of a generation dwindling. William Bridges is an author and leading expert on transformation. Bridges juxtaposes change and transformation as follows. Change is situational. Transformation, on the other hand, is psychological. Without transformation, 
A change is just a rearrangement of the furniture. Unless transformation happens, the change won't work. The sector, its leaders and governors need to stop rearranging the furniture. We must strive for transformation. Incremental changes will not serve us in the 21st century. A just and equitable recovery demands it from us. Many leaders and governors will resist these changes or find them uncomfortable. If so, it's time to invite others to lead and govern in this new economy. We cannot continue to be held back by incrementalism in the sector. We need bold, intentional, and courageous leaders. Nothing else will do. The resiliency of Canadian communities depends upon it. Philanthropic organizations are used to addressing community issues that exist beyond its institutional borders. Are we able to effectively address the issues that exist within it? Trickle-down philanthropy, racism, diversity, inclusion, our responsibilities as investors, transition to a net zero economy is only the beginning. We need more than imagination, we need action. Thank you. Back to you, Isadora. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, well, uh, that was really intriguing and highly inspirational. Um, yes, at this point, I would just like to invite, uh, okay, we have a first question, but I would just like to invite everyone to either place their questions or comments in the chat or just their name and I can um, ask them to come forward. Uh, so this one is from Jean-Marc uh, Fontan. Uh, making the change between liberal enterprise to social enterprise, having more diversity in governance structure of power, making more place to, to, for millennium people. These are certainly the elements for a radical transformation. But don't we also need a profound cultural change, a new narrative or a new culture or a new set of cultural settings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's a statement within that question that I would agree with, and that is... Uh... Um, we do need a significant change in culture to foster the type of transformation we need. Um, you know, we are, we've been conditioned um, through over 150 years of history in Canada around what charities mean and what charities do. And, and we've held that long uh, belief for quite some time. And we're starting to see that younger people are, uh, are, are really thinking about justice and our role in providing social justice in this country and acknowledging that within the constructs of doing good, that we have to make reparation and restitution for the things that we have not done good or been uh, ignoring for quite some time. And that is demonstrated in our work with indigenous communities and the black community in the vulnerable communities across this country. And a key part of that, as I mentioned, is who's governing our organizations. Oftentimes we bring a very small group of people in this country to govern philanthropic organizations and charitable institutions. We need folks to govern organizations who have lived experience as well. And so I think that's critical. If you want different outcomes, you have to have different decision makers. And, and that was something I talked about. Thank you. And I think the following question from uh, Kathy Taylor from the ONN also touches upon some of, uh, some, some of the things you just said. Uh, so in your experience, uh, how do we move towards transformational steps? What are the practical next steps for this? Mm -hmm. So I presented a whole bunch of data um, and I think some of the most meaningful data is the cultural collision um, between generations. And whether they're millennials or even a younger group of Canadians, they fundamentally see investing and doing good in a, in a tangibly different way than generations before them. And I think when we look at our institutions, they're not necessarily governed or led by that group of Canadians. And it is precisely that group of Canadians that is creating this level of disruption, particularly through the pandemic, 
because they're the ones that are being left behind. And they are the most diverse group of Canadians on, that we've ever seen in this country. So I think really providing space for younger Canadians to step up, to lead, to govern, will lead to transformation, new business models, new funding regimes, and a different way of meeting the needs of, uh, of our communities and resolving inequality. So in a way, uh, a change of leadership would uh, take us uh, a step closer to, to this transformational change. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, you spoke uh, in the beginning briefly about uh, being on the brink of a new economy uh, and uh, sort of the, the, the need for the philanthropic sector to find its place in this economy. Can you expand a little bit on that and perhaps what would the value proposition for the philanthropic sector? in that new concept be? Yeah, I think we're, we're challenging a lot of base assumptions um, when we think about this new economy. I'll go back to August of 2019, and there's a group of very powerful global CEOs in the US, and they sit together on something that's called the Business Roundtable. And it's led by Jamie Dimon, um, who is a, a, a banking CEO, a well-known CEO, and they made a statement in August of 2019. And in that statement, they said, um, we've had this long held belief that corporations exist for the purpose of serving shareholders and creating shareholder wealth. In fact, maximizing shareholder wealth. That is their primary purpose. And, and these CEOs, and I think it's 160 of them said, that can't be the way forward. We cannot exist only to serve our shareholders and creating wealth. We have to think about stakeholders and think about our purpose more broadly. We have to consider the communities in which we operate. We have to think about the people and the other corporations within our supply chain. We have to consider our customers and our employees. We have to consider the environment in which we operate in. And no one of no single one of those things should be given precedence over the other. I relate that to philanthropy because we have a culture that centers the wishes and the powers of donors. And donors are critically important. I don't in any way detract from the importance of donors within philanthropy. However, the power of donors needs to be reevaluated. We can't simply exist to be the right arm of donors and to simply fulfill donors' wishes. We have to be a better facilitator of ensuring that the resources that are given to us from the donors are really addressing the priorities in the community and that those decisions are made by the community, not a single donor. I think we have to look at structures like donor advised funds and we have to clear up misconceptions about what a donor advised fund is supposed to do and what it actually does. And I think these are critical pieces. These are critical assumptions that we need to have conversations about that will ultimately change how we operate. We also have this, we also have this long held belief that endowments um, and the permanency around those endowments is sacred. And I talked about this in the keynote. Um, capital is important. It is uplifting, it is empowering, and capital benefits society. We know that. However, when capital is held among a small group, whether it's wealthy individuals or wealthy foundations, that exacerbates inequality and creates polarization and tension in community. And we have to think about sharing our capital much in the same way that the Laidlaw Foundation and the Inspirit Foundation have done in transferring capital, not granting money, although they have given granted money, but they transferred their capital to underfunded communities, including the black community and the indigenous community. That is a new way of doing business. It's an innovative way of doing business and it's truly transformative. When foundations think about capital and this concept of sharing it, so that others can be uplifted, empowered, and self-determining, then we know we are reaching transformation 
then we know we are using capital in a really responsible way. Thank you. Um, and I think um, we have also a question that uh, perhaps takes this a bit in a more specific. So uh, this is from Pro uh, Professor Francois Boer. Uh, do you know any examples of foundations uh, bringing on board people other than the close circle that already exists to manage their organizations? You've started with some examples already, so I was wondering if you can add to this as well. I think we're in in the process in this country. Um, you know, the 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 recent survey. Um, that Senator uh, Omidvar has led uh, through Statistics Canada has certainly given light um, that although we've been working on diversity for quite some time, we're not there yet. The, the makeup and the composition of Canadian communities and the demographic shifts are accelerating. Um, they're happening faster than institutions can keep up. And and building out boards and leadership teams that reflect a whole bunch of different levels of diversity um, is a challenge. It's a process. We're not there yet, um, but I'm, 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 I know that foundations are talking about this at the board level. There is a distinction to be made between um, private philanthropic uh, funders and public ones. And I think private philanthropy, there are some spaces where they have made concerted efforts to be more diverse and reflect beyond the family structure. But there are still many that have a lot of work to do in that space. Thank you. And also a comment from Kristin Q. Um, she really liked the framing of trickle down philanthropy. Uh, so building on um, what you have discussed around that, uh, one question. As governments forfeit billions of dollars in tax revenue to subsidize philanthropy, what duties do you think philanthropic organizations should have in the light of those subsidies? Or put another way, how can we know that those public subsidies for philanthropy are justified? Mm -hmm. You know, the, um, the, the tax credit system in this country was set up to incentivize giving. And it is certainly, it certainly does that. Um, I think a lot of Canadians do give and, and probably would give without a tax credit, but many are driven by that. The, the challenge that I see is this, is that there is a distinction that I have to make. There's giving of large gifts to foundations and there's giving to frontline organizations. When you give to a frontline organization, almost all of your money will go into meeting the needs and, and, and drive the mission of that organization at the front line. For foundations, what we do is we set up uh, endowments. Uh, we take that gift, put it in a donor advised fund, we invest it, and then we spend the income. So the capital is retained uh, to, to meet that, that criteria of permanency. I think what happens is there ends up being an indirect tax on Canadians if too much money is on the sideline. So foundations do need a base of sustainability. They, they do require to have a degree of permanency so that they can be there throughout any economic cycle. The question is how much? My contention is that the 95-5 model, as I call it, so you, you, you hold on to 95% of your assets and you spend 5%, is, is too skewed in the wrong direction. I think there are things that we can do um, to, to maximize the benefit to the income tax system and the tax revenues foregone by the, by, the, by the government. And that is to invest in social enterprises and to invest in the social economy. So like there's two things that can happen. We can spend more and we can invest better. Not simply in the capital markets, but we can spend, we can invest in companies that are both generating profit, but also doing good and are meeting the targets in the, in the, the, uh, in, in the, the transition to our net zero um, economy. Thank you. Uh, so another thing from the chat, um, 
building on what you just spoke about, do you believe that we can leverage donors or capital owners to spur change in the governance and culture of foundations? So for example, we promote messaging that donors should push for more social enterprise type philanthropy or a much greater disbursement to, the, uh, oper uh, to operational funding ratio or overall encourage activist investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, th there's a lot of talk about um, uh, trust-based philanthropy and trust-based philanthropy is being informed and driven um, by the community, by those organizations that, that are being funded. And lots of conversations are taking place right now in Canada about the level of disbursement that is appropriate. And in fact, the most recent federal government, ha federal government budget had, had and contained language um, that, that implied that we were going to have a national conversation on the disbursement quota. Um, so that is happening. And I think we, we're likely to see some changes to that. Um, there's also a lot of conversation happening on who, it, it can't simply be about spending more, but who are we actually supporting in the community? Are we supporting everyone? And, and certainly the unfunded report, and there have been some other studies that demonstrate we have gaps that, that our current ecosystem of, of funding or of funders isn't meeting all those gaps. And so um, I, I appreciate that there's actually two um, uh, infrastructure organizations that have shown up in the last year. Um, and I mentioned both of them, the Indigenous Peoples Resilience Fund and the Foundation for the Black uh, Communities. And both of those organizations are set up to meet those gaps. And we need to encourage more of that happening, but traditional conventional philanthropy also needs to support the creation, the self-determination and the independence of those, um, those infrastructure organizations so that we can truly have a philanthropic infrastructure in Canada that represents Canada. Thank you. And as we're discussing possible ways uh, into moving into a more um, uh, transformational approach, um, a question from Manuel Ita Italian uh, regarding uh, governance and decision making. Uh, so how realistic would you say it is to have citizen assemblies determining how money would be spent on or project prioritization? Mm -hmm. I think it's extremely realistic because it's already happening. Um, it, you can go to most um, large or medium-sized cities. And if, if a developer wants to come in and um, develop a piece of property, um, oftentimes they have to work on what's called community benefit agreements. Um, and within that construct, they have to think about green space. They have to think about schools. They have to think about other services that the community will require. Um, so it's not simply about um, you know, a, a constituency, a group of people um, creating something on their own. Um, they have to engage the community. The municipality plays a role um, and, and everybody has input into that. And I think um, surprisingly, philanthropy has been a, um, and this is changing, but it's been a closed system uh, for the most part. It, it's been a black box. And I think we have to invite the community in uh, to our decision-making processes, but not simply the people we're comfortable with <laughs> or simply the people that we're closest to, because that's what we've done. Um, we really have to bring everybody in, um, all different voices, even the ones that make us uncomfortable at times, because those are the ones we really, really haven't been listening to. Um, and they're the most important voices because they've been left out for such a long time. Thank you. And I just realized I sort of missed on something uh, as you were earlier talking about the 595 model of philanthropy. Uh, so uh, according to you, what would be a good ratio then as opposed to the 595? Mm -hmm. the, the, I don't think there's a, um, a binary answer to that because I, in, in part, um, the size of the organization and the size of the endowment will play um, a meaningful um, uh, role in that. Smaller foundations, you can have a foundation that has $10 million um, and, and their ability to, to grant based on the type of investment products that they can get into uh, will be constrained. Um, but if you've got a foundation with a billion dollars, very different. So those are two very different 
organizations with different business models that are driven by scale. And so scale will inform the answer on that. Um, and we might have to stratify um, uh, foundations and have differing uh, levels uh, based, on, based on scale. The other thing is, is that um, you know, certain foundations, um, they're not growing in assets. Private ones usually receive one or two gifts from the family. Um, and then their asset base is their asset base. So um, th th their, their ability to grant will, will be primarily dictated by investment returns and their prospects on future investment returns. Whereas um, public foundations like the ones that I represent, they are growing their asset base every year. They are adding new capital every year to their endowment. And so their prospects on spending can be impacted by that as well. Um, so there, there's a bunch of factors that play out. I don't think it's a one size fits all. I think our disbursement quota calculation is just too blunt. Um, it, it applies to everybody in the same way. And um, there are different circumstances that it doesn't account for. The other thing is that disbursement quota only takes into account spending. A lot of foundations are considering how they are having an impact through their investing, but that, that doesn't get captured in the DQ. So um, th these are things that demonstrate that the calculation of the DQ is, is growing obsolete. Um, it doesn't meet where the sector currently is and we need to have a bigger conversation about impact and how we can measure impact um, within the sector based on the different criteria and the, the different types of business models we have out there. Um, so as we're nearing the end of the session, just one last question. Uh, should we also look at the roots of the creation of capital to have more distribution of capital and more environmental attention at the production level in a way to diminish the accumulation process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I think this is the, this goes to the paradox um, uh, issue that I, I spoke about. You know, the, the Gini coefficient in Canada, which measures um, the distribution of, of income or wealth, typically is somewhere between 30 and 40. <clears throat> there are some countries that are as high as, you know, the high 60s, the low 70s. And I think overall, we have to acknowledge we're, we're, we, do, we do okay. But um, according to the Broadbent Institute, the Office of the Parliamentary Budget, um, they have all shown that wealth resides in a very small uh, group of Canadians and wealth in the charitable sector resides in a very small group of foundations. And so we have, we both rely upon the wealth for our existence, our power, our positionality, our ability to fund. Um, but the system that drives that is, is also one that we're a part of. And I think we need to step back and really look at how social finance and social entrepreneurship is a natural result for that because we can now invest socially responsibly in companies that are both creating profit and doing good. And I think our ability to accelerate um, that market, that sector in Canada um, and really lead the globe um, in social entrepreneurship is our opportunity to deal with exactly that systemic issue. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so uh, just to briefly summarize uh, some of the things you sort of emphasized um, throughout the, the Q&A and um, about the ways in which we can move forward or what are potential next steps in um, increasing the contribution of foundations uh, and their work towards um, justice and equality. So one thing we discussed was this, the disbursement quota, but uh, not just as a blunt sort of uh, increase uh, from where we currently have it, but more of a, as a, its customization to the different circumstances that the different foundations are in, and also looking at other types of investments that foundations are doing within their communities. Um, we also spoke about uh, how much money is spent uh, by foundations, but also where are they spent and how are they spent and uh, how big a part of, those, uh, of that money actually goes into social investing and actually creating um, meaningful change for communities. And in the end, uh, I think that uh, sort of the, the understanding that we need uh, a new generation, um, but also um, other groups of people, um, mostly those that have been in a way excluded from uh, the conversations uh, to be um, introduced and to be uh, invited to, to 
uh, take part in decision making uh, uh, within the foundational uh, community. Okay, uh, so um, I would like to thank you for uh, for this um, really inspirational conversation and for setting the tone and uh, giving us all food for thought. 